going through the next 10. This next one's a little tough. So we're going to slow this down a little bit, but not a lot. Um, here we're looking at two different equilibrium constants at two different temperatures for the KSP of AGBR. A uh, little track that's going to come up later is this is the reverse of this reaction. Uh, so the KSP would normally start with the solid and that would then produce the ions. And so we're going to need to remember to take that into consideration. Uh, the equation is the natural log of equilibrium constant 2 over equilibrium constant 1 is equal to negative delta H, which is what we're searching for, over R times 1, sorry, 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. Okay, so we're going to plug everything into here. Uh, we're going to do some plugging and chugging. So we're going to have, um, we, should, we should pick one set. It doesn't matter which one you do, you just need to kind of uh, make sure that you're consistent with it. The one that I did was I plugged in the larger as K2. So I plugged in 6.5 times 10 to the negative 12th over the 5 times 10 to the negative 13. And I actually plugged that in as just the value of that, which was uh, 13. And that came out to be 2.56. I did all that. And we've got negative delta H searching for, we use 8.304. 8.304 is in joules per mole Kelvin, so that means that we're going to get an answer here in joules. And we're going to plug in our T2. So T2 is going to be the one that matches this value, which is the higher temperature, which is 50 degrees. So 323 Kelvin and 1 minus 298 for 25 Kelvin. So when you go through and do all the manipulations on that, we end up finding that delta H is 82,000. per mole, but that is for this delta H. So the reverse reaction would then be the flip sign of that, and that's where we come up with A, which is negative 82 kilojoules per mole. Okay, this one I am very, oh no, I'm sorry, this is a different one than what I expected, sorry. So this one, we're looking at a heating curve, solid to liquid, um, so solid, melting, liquid heating, boiling, and going up from there. Um, we're starting at the melting point, which is five degrees Celsius, which is here. And it says that we are going, uh, we're just adding a certain amount of energy to it. So this one kind of conveniently goes through and gives us some very specific things. So heat of vaporization is 30.8. That's gonna be right here. And we are dealing with exactly one mole, I believe. So, yep, one mole of solid. And it says that heat of fusion, which is going to be to melt it in this case, is 9.9 .9 kilojoules per mole. And that it says that in order to heat it up to 80 degrees, the molar heat capacity is 135 joules per mole Kelvin. So, when we go through and do the joules, for one mole for uh, up to 80, what is it, 85? 80 degrees. So when we heat it from five degrees to 80 degrees, we're gonna have to take this value and multiply it by 75 kelvins. So when you do that, that comes out to 10 point something kilojoules. Let me get my exact thing here, so. Yeah, 10.1 kilojoules. So basically it takes 9.9 .9 kilojoules to melt one mole, it takes 10.1 kilojoules to get up to 80 degrees. Now it says that we input exactly 20 kilojoules of energy, and so that would take us to right at this mark. We're starting here, it takes 9.9 .9 kilojoules to get here, it takes another 10.1 to get here. That's all of our energy, so we're now right here. So at this point we go over and look at what the answers are, and this is where it gets a little dicey because this would prompt me to put liquid only. But in all honesty, I don't know how the complication of this works because at this critical juncture, we're right about to start doing the phase transition into the gaseous state, but the vapor pressure of this is not zero. So really, it technically is a mixture of liquid and gas, um, but the answer that's probably the best choice is liquid only because they put us right particular on that spot, and so they really kind of wanted to emphasize that. So C is probably the most accurate, but only in a highly technical sense, and so therefore B is our best choice. If we had gotten to, say, here, we would probably have been more tempted to put liquid only, uh, even though there still would have been a little bit of gas present. And so we're ignoring that because of such a low pressure, or I don't know why, um, but B was the correct answer that they learned.
23 here is another tricky one. So this one we have a natural log of equilibrium constant versus one over temperature. Uh, that immediately prompted me to go to the slope is equal to negative enthalpy over R. So since the slope here is negative, that means that our enthalpy change is positive. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and look at what they're looking at. They're looking at ammonium nitrate. And um, the first prompt says the pH of the molar solution increases as temperature is raised. Now, as temperature raised, we go in this direction on the graph, and as we do that, the natural log of K is increasing, becoming more positive. That means that K is increasing, and that means we're getting more products, which means we're getting more H plus uh, from the NH4 plus. And so the pH would not be going up, the pH would be going down, so we know that one is incorrect. And then the second part says that delta S is positive. So we know that delta H is positive. That's not going to be helpful for this being a uh, spontaneous reaction. So the question then kind of lies in, well, is this a spontaneous reaction? So if we start with negative 19.5 and we undo the natural log there, so we do e to the negative 19.5, we end up with an equilibrium constant of about 10 to the negative 9. That equilibrium constant is going to drop as we move this way. So that implies that our delta G is definitely positive. And from that, then we're really probably not looking at an end of free change being positive. And if it is, that's that's more of a combination of factors rather than something we should assume. So in that case, we're going with D. Neither option is correct for that. Okay, this question I'm not very certain of, so I did not get this one correct. I really didn't know what to do on this. Um, so if you know, please chime in in the comments. Um, it says that the heat capacity of ice, the solid, is smaller than the heat capacity of the liquid form. Okay, then it asks, what can we conclude about the heat diffusion of ice at 263 Kelvin? So I'm not 100% sure of what exactly that is. So when I first thought that, what I thought was that that might be some kind of, you have to melt the ice in addition to raising it 10 degrees in order to get to the temperature of melting, which would imply C, which is what I picked, which was incorrect. Um, so the correct answer that they've listed is A. What that means is that you're probably doing a direct transition between water and ice, which does kind of make sense because you obviously can't have a heat effusion that only goes in one direction, right? So you have to be at an interchange between the two, which must mean that either the pressure conditions are different or somehow they've changed this to establish an equilibrium at a different temperature. I don't know what that involves, and so I guess I would rationalize this by saying that since this means that it's easier to change the temperature, that it must also be easier to change the state, and so therefore the enthalpy of fusion is smaller at that temperature than this one, but really that's just a guess and I'm not really clear on how to address that. Okay, things that I am a little more confident in. So 25 was a very easy one. All you had to do on this, as you should not have done any calculations or figuring, um, all you would have done was just go through and say, here are the units. So if the units are molar to the minus one seconds to the minus one, that's going to tell us what the actual order is. Uh, I started that by going this would have been first order, so having one additional molarity in the denominator means that I've got one additional um, order to the total reaction, so I would have second order overall. So second order, we're looking at rate, there's molarity times the minus one is equal to k times molarity squared. And so then molarity to the minus one will undo one of those, producing that, and that therefore is our unit. What the reaction is, anything else was irrelevant. And then furthering that along here, here, this is a nice and easy uh, rate law. I don't, I don't know what the deal is here, why oh, there's no tricks. So we double this, and our rate doubles. That tells us that A is first order. And then between experiments one and three, we triple this, and our rate triples squared. So it goes up by nine. And so that means that this is second order, excuse me. So we have A first order, B second order, and that would give us B. Okay, this one also wasn't terribly difficult. Uh, didn't land exactly the transition point, but that didn't matter. So it wants to know when it would go to 15% of its initial value. So all I did for this was I said starting at time zero, and then 138 days later, we would go from having 100% to half of that, 50%. Then another 100 days goes by, so that would be 276 days total. We would end up at 25%. And another 138 days goes by, and that's going to get us to over 400. So, 414, and that would be a 12.5%. So, we're looking at a time between 276 and 
414 days. The only one that fits that criterion was Part D, so therefore D had to be the correct choice. In addition to that, 377 days is very close to 414, 15% is a little closer to 12.5. So everything made sense and you're good to go. If that's not the case, then you have to go through and do some exponential calculations, but we didn't, so we're not going to. All right, and then this one is also kind of an interesting question. I like this one. So in this one, we have A and B reacting, and it says they start at equal concentrations. Now, typically when you run a regular kinetics uh, thing, one of them is at such an excess that the amount doesn't change and therefore doesn't influence the rate. So since the natural log of concentration versus time is linear, that tells us that the reaction is first order. However, it tells us specifically that either A is first order or B is first order, and then if one of those is true, then the other one is the zero order. So if A and B were both first order, we would see this not changing in this particular manner because both would be influencing the rate, and so therefore we would see something of a second order nature. Therefore, we only know that one and not the other is first order, and we don't know which of these two things is true. And so we can't make any conclusions about this, and therefore D was the correct answer there. Basically, if you look, Assume this is correct, you're going to get a linear relationship. Assuming this is correct, these concentrations are still going to change even though A is not influencing the rate. And so the change in concentration can't be used to determine that at equal amounts. Okay, and then another pretty simple one here. So here we have the slow step is here, so our rate is going to be dependent upon those two factors. So we have our rate law is equal to K times N2O2 times H2, but we don't want an intermediate to be present in our rate loss. We're going to go back where did the N2O2 come from. We have an equilibrium established here, so we can go ahead and replace this with these while switching around some of the rate constants. But we get a new rate constant, so we don't care, and we end up with NO2 squared times H2, and that was B. And the last one, 30, was also pretty simple. So here it says that the overall reaction is endothermic. We're starting here, we're ending here. That means we're losing chemical energy. It's going to get, the uh, particles are going to be moving faster here, and it's going to get released to the surroundings. So that would be exothermic. And then the activation energy is 40. It goes from 20 to 40, but the activation energy would only be 20. So neither is true, and D is our correct choice.